Hi. Um, well, good afternoon. Uh, it's been a long, uh, exciting day. I'm really, uh, this is really special for me, and I'm really honored to be here because I've been here since uh, January uh, at the American Academy, which is in Vonzi. And the artist, there's only two invited per year uh, by a secret committee, and you commit to coming one semester. Uh, so in the fall, Huma Baba came, uh, the brilliant uh, Pakistani sculpture artist, and I chose to take the spring semester. Um, and uh, it was pointed out, um, the, the academy was interested in bringing me here because they wanted me to see Eisenhutenstadt. So I went with a historian to the border of Poland and spent a day walking around Eisenhutenstadt, really taking in what the architecture and the space and the landscape meant in terms of looking at a classless society, especially coming from a landscape developed by an industrialist capitalist like Andrew Carnegie and dealing with the ramifications and impacts of the loss and the collapse of the steel industry and what it's meant to subsequent generations. Um, the narrative that I will present to you through um, a very distilled brief PowerPoint um, of my work offers an opportunity to hear about this narrative and history that has deliberately been omitted, erased, and silenced from American history and psyche, which is what happened um, to the African Americans after those steel mills closed, what were the ramifications of um, social and economic discrimination against our families and our heritage, and also what happened to the women once all these industries left uh, within the own uh, institution and the way that um, libraries and schools teach about towns like Braddock or about Andrew Carnegie, you never hear about what happened to the women and what our roles actually were in the steel mills and also how we remained there abandoned for over three decades after the Reagan administration. And so um, the, the longer version of this presentation can be found at the American Academy Berlin site. If you click, if you go to the main page and you click on media, it should come up the title um, Activism, Memory, and the Social Landscape, where you can hear the entire thing. What I won't do today is perform the narrative that I do. I've been writing with my work since 2006, so typically I show up to a place and I'll um, narrate over a very particular edit depending on the context of uh, the conference with this work, how this work has grown. So you'll see here in this edit how I've grown as an artist and an educator from working from a very personal autobiographical point of view to expanding into the semi-autobiographical collaborative point of view, collaborating with people outside of the institution, and to, of course, speaking generally about this new movement of what it looks like and what it means to redevelop rust-built towns like Braddock. Um, the reason I'm excited to be in Berlin is because Berlin has already dealt with the, the loss of, of the steel industry and has already developed some of these things. For example, the European Industrial Heritage Route. Um, I'm very curious about traveling that route and seeing it because um, one of the things that I speak to is not so much the industry and, and capitalism in the buildings, but the fact that the people are always missing. We don't honor the people, the workers, the laborers. We never put a sign up or a placard or you know, champion them as the important figures and people of the social um, fabric of our uh, society and of our landscape. And so it would be interesting to go along that path and then return home back to the US and look at the Rust Belt crossing through Ohio, Pennsylvania, all these areas all the way upstate to see exactly how the United States is going to deal with this. And we know um, a lot of things have been left abandoned for three decades now. And so I feel like I'm getting a foreshadow by being here of what's going to come when I return back home. And I'll be able to um, culturally interrupt and dispute some of the decisions that these developers will make. And so in this triptych here that you see, the placard of John Fraser, he was uh, first Scotsman uh, to settle in Braddock. Uh, where his cabin was is exactly where Andrew Carnegie's steel mill, the Edgar Thompson plant, is located today. Uh, and then you see Andrew Carnegie and then you see an image of me 
in the middle, um, dressed as one of my grandmother's favorites. She has a massive porcelain doll collection, and I'm kind of a part of that. And so this is me dressed up the way she would dress me. Um, but what I'm actually getting at in terms of, of taking these images and placing myself in the middle is visually um, pointing out like how I am fighting and grappling with existing within a history, within a local space that I've been displaced from and that I actually don't exist. And I'm writing myself into this history, I'm writing my community into this history, and I'm writing my family into this history. And now I'm fighting to preserve a whole cultural history of people that are being displaced by artists and creative class people and institutions that have an interest in our land. So for example, this book, um, Arcadia Publishing, all over the United States, they do these books based on small towns in America. And so Arcadia comes out and does this book on Braddock. And you know, I take this book back to my studio and I'm looking at it. I got it from the Braddock Carnegie Library in Braddock, which is the first Carnegie Library in America. And you know, I get to the end of this book and not one African American was in this book. And this is the 21st century and we're still being omitted. And the irony to it is being here, um, ironically I came to the academy and I met the writer of this book, Dennis C. Dickerson. And it took Dennis and I to cross the Atlantic, as two African Americans to cross the Atlantic to meet each other and we're both from here. Um, so again, Berlin has done me this great honor. Um, I've been quietly trying to complete my first book, which is going to come out this fall, of this work that you're about to see. And, you know, Dennis saw me present and we've been speaking and he's going to write an essay in the book. And I, I, I felt like the book wasn't complete. I knew I was missing something. And of course, Berlin revealed to me what I was missing, which is Dennis and his scholarship. Um, so he's a historian. He worked in Andrew Carnegie's mill, he witnessed what truly happened. And so all his research and work, I have the back end of it through photographs that kind of marries his research and my images about the displacement of women as well as our whole culture and identity. The other person, especially in terms of thinking of pedagogy and remembering artists that have come before you, um, Tony Buba, he is uh, an important, incredibly important Italian-American filmmaker that has made over 20 films on the collapse of our industry. Um, because of the new capital interest and corporate interest, you aren't hearing about artists like Tony Buba or artists like myself because they want to erase the reality that we've documented and put a new narrative to it, which I'll show you in a second. But, you know, Tony has proof through his films, through Struggles and Still, the story of African-American still workers, what actually happened. And I'll show you a clip from that as well. And I think it's only fitting if we're going to talk about Black Mountain College and uh, inclusion. And um, what I'm going to add, of course, is complicating it with the layers of race and class and politics and identity. I'd like to just pull a quote from um, Stuart that I think is really important that will speak to this presentation. Um, it was created in a, a campaign against racism in the media in 1979 on a BBC broadcast. Hall critiqued how racism is disseminated in popular culture. And he states, racism never has been put in a critical context by the media in this country. When it comes to fighting racism, the media are part of the problem. They perpetuate myths and stereotypes about black people. They lie by omission, distortion, and selection. They give racist inflated importance and respectability. And I think that this statement can also be extended to museums and institutions. Um, I have definitely fought a great deal to have my work present in a lot of the institutions um, and not compromising on my beliefs and ideas and the way that I want to educate viewers that have come to some of the exhibitions. And I'll be able to also show you a, an example of what I did um, during the Whitney Biennial. 
Um, my work doesn't end when it goes up on the wall. It's actually where it all begins. And so you'll see more of that in a moment. But so I can locate you in, in terms of this place, um, you know, Braddock is a historic steel mill town that's located along the Monongahela River. It's nine miles outside of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, which would make that East Allegheny County in Pittsburgh. So it's not that far. For example, the Carnegie International definitely used Braddock as one of its satellite spaces in this previous um, international show. So this is the Edgar Thompson plant. Um, I am actually in a helicopter. This is 2013, this past spring. So I'm in a helicopter hanging from the helicopter shooting this because people keep referring to Braddock as a post-industrial town. This is not post-industrial. This is not Detroit. In fact, I would say it's worse than Detroit because this plant has been operating since 1872. There haven't been any regulations or any questions or any resistance against the environmental degradation and toxicity and pollution. And so you see how the Monongahela River is kind of cutting through it. That is also polluted as well. Um, right below, you see how the way Carnegie had it designed. I mean, this is 200 acres of this industrial plant. Um, and then the workers' homes always surrounded it on the periphery. Carnegie was very clear about how he wanted to keep people very close to it. Braddock is not, it's not even a mile long. So this is a dense, concentrated area um, that has very harsh EPA levels. Uh, and, and currently, um, some of the people that have come, for example, they have ideas to put a restaurant right here because they want they think the restaurant in terms of priority is the most important thing that they have a foodie spot um, and so I needed to go up in the helicopter to really shed some light on that another view um, also coming a little further back so you see like the the, the silhouette of the older part um, when they first made the stacks so again, I'm hanging from a helicopter shooting over. And for me, yes, they're railroads, but these are also tracks of scarification of what industry has actually done to the environment. And one of the most important things in my work is that I don't differentiate between the body and the landscape. So what's been done to the landscape coincides and parallels what exactly is happening to the inhabitants' bodies. Um, this image, it's a, it's a still life um, that my grandmother always set up next to her, her bed, no matter where we moved. And it's called Aunt, Aunt Midgey and Grandma Ruby 2007. So my work kind of goes in and out of still lifes, landscapes, and very intimate portraits. There are always gelatin silver prints. Uh, I shoot medium to large format with film, process it myself, print it myself. At this level, I work with one, only one master printer that I trust that shares the same political views as me as well. So we're able to print exactly the way it needs to be meticulously printed. And the reason that my work is still printed this way is because I'm speaking back to the urgency and the importance of social documentary work out of the 1930s. And this sets up this paradigm that got me fascinated with making this work. And I, I began making this work when I was 17. So I was you know, coming out of high school, going into undergrad, innocently making this work. So the way I'm talking today is certainly not the way I was speaking or thinking of it before. I didn't have this knowledge. Um, but what I did know and what I was curious about is when I first saw the photograph of Dorothea Lange's migrant mother, what I saw in that image was that whenever you show an American and someone young that photograph, they only say Dorothea Lang. And I wanted to know what was the name of the woman and her children in the photograph. And we weren't able to answer that question and, you know, unless you were of a certain generation. And that concerned me and made me become very sensitive to subjectivity. Who is allowed to author an image? Who can narrate the story? And why is that important? And you know, further digging into the FSA, I realized that what 
spoke to me and made it complicated for me is that Dorothea Lange was hired by Roy Stryker. Roy Stryker works for Columbia University and the United States government. And when she contested him removing information about her encounter with Florence Owens Thompson and her children, she was relieved from that assignment. So that created a paradigm for me. So what is the difference between a, a corporate governed commissioned image and that struggle between the actual artist who's shooting it and that negotiation and struggle or erasure of the person that's actually in the image? And that's kind of where I picked up on uh, asking myself this question, which basically is what would Florence Owens Thompson's self-portraits look like had she made them herself and not the United States government? And what would it mean today if it wasn't proliferated and emptied of all its meaning? And so um, my family in particular the lineage between my grandmother, mother, and me is that my grandmother grew up in Braddock in the 30s. This was, you know, the South was in its depression, but Braddock was actually at this moment very booming. You had people that immigrated from, from Russia, from Germany, from Italy, from Croatia, and also people from the South, as well as a lot of Scottish people. You also, what is never discussed, there were people that were sent from prisons. Anyone who was a prisoner or a convict was sent to work in that factory from Scotland, as well as forced labor coming from the South and from uh, an extension of slavery. So there's all these hidden things about labor and how we all ended up there. But the bottom line that happens is it becomes a melting pot. So most of us are not just black. Unfortunately, in the US, we only talk in terms of black and white. And my experience, even though I'm a descendant of Scottish blue collar working people, it's been that I'm African American. So that's from the, the point that I will speak. But my, my mother grew up there in the 50s, and this was during white flight and uh, further segregation um, due to the GI Bill and people wanting to live further away from the mill. And because of this type of redlining and not allowing certain people to buy housing, there was disinvestment once the 70s hit and you saw that the steel industry was definitely gonna collapse because of global economy. So you have white people fleeing from Braddock as well as closing all their businesses. Then you also have the government deciding that it wasn't gonna have any type of funding. So all local state government funding cut off from this community. It's been that way since I was born. So 1982, I'm born straight into this place that is this restricted, abandoned zone that lost a majority of its infrastructure. Uh, and I was taking a bus in order to go to high school to get my education. And also, by the time the 90s hit, you had the war on drugs. So this is subsequent damage and hit after hit that really left us without any stability and opportunity to be able to deal with the redevelopment that has come today. And so this is a still from a video called Self-Portrait United States Still. In the video, this rotates on a loop for about two and a half minutes, and it can be projected large or small amongst other photographs in the space. Um, and all you hear is the sound of the mill kind of spewing out all the toxins and all the industry and all the railroads passing. You can hear all those details. And I kind of just stand there breathing, taking deep breaths like you would if you were in a doctor's appointment, how they come up and they make you take the deep breaths over and over. This is the 1908 um, 8th Street Market. In fact, when I was a child, I used to go here to buy bread and milk for my grandmother. And it was also my childhood bus stop. Um, so for me, it has a, a very specific implied meaning. And I think uh, it's interesting in terms of looking at it from like a Robert Adams new topographics kind of point, a point of view about having this disdain about what man has actually done to the environment. When you see an image like this, I mean, this is this beautiful, colorful mural. And on the little blip, it says, the world is yours. And I just find that to be so ironic, you know, coming from this to seeing this. But then also, you know, if we're still thinking about Robert Adams and just like 
a very poetic way of me kind of pointing that out through the way that I'm shooting it. I'm very in invested in the history of art and photography, but also I know that these works to me are social representations. But you see the, how the, the past kind of still seeps, like, seeps out over the top of that mural with that old building, with that old brick, that, and you see the mill kind of peeking in from the left-hand upper corner. You know, my, my grandmother does not have an art education. She is not considered an installation artist, but the title of this piece is Grandma Ruby's Installation, 2002. Uh, and I, I think I learned a lot about um, class and that even though we lived in a very impoverished community, that we could still control our class and what we wanted the world to be like within our homes in spite of what the media was saying. And at that point, the media was saying it was a ghost town and that it was a violent place and we were all drug addicts and we weren't worth saving. But here within a woman's home that went through all that history, you have this incredible porcelain doll collection, which really is a representation of the United Nations. I mean, she pretty much has every um, identity there. And this is a portrait that we worked on together. She, she really didn't like um, photographs to be taken of her, and this is one of the few cases where we did uh, collaborate together. Um, and you notice in the, in the, in the television screen, it, it's A&E, and I noticed that only after when I was printing it, like A&E, Arts and Entertainment. I mean, this is such a great coincidence. There's no one there. We're just sitting there on the floor together, and we both just look over our shoulder and you see the cable releases running from behind me around. So, you know, this is Grandma Ruby and Me 2005. And, you know, I put this one in here because not only understanding that triangle between Dorothea Lang, Roy Stryker, and uh, Florence Owen Thompson, but also understanding that I needed to break being able to have access and privilege to being educated about art theory and photography and actually really take the theory and apply it to real life situations. The only way to break that paradigm and that privilege and that type of elite attitude is to give the power over to the people that are actually in these communities. It, 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 you know, my grandmother felt like I should always make portraits of myself, so I also can credit her to that idea. Even though I did read it in a book, my grandmother also said it. She didn't have to read that history to come up with that idea on her own. But I think that's really important because in the history of photography, seldom do you see attention being given to artists that really did relinquish their power to give it over to the subjects, to create, to choreograph, to, to, to determine how an image would be made. And this is a, a video that my mother and I made um, with thousands of JPEGs that we ran through Final Cut and it kind of, you know, becomes this very stop animated piece. And often with my mother, we would make portraits of each other after she would come from surgery or, you know, these would be documented when we were sick. Um, you know, if you live in Braddock, if you're from there, you have a terminal illness. So, you know, my grandmother passed away in 2009 from pancreatic cancer. Uh, my mother is um, holding on by a thread right now also fighting cancer and some type of neurological disorder that we don't know what it is. And um, I've been battling lupus most of my life as well. And I think that it's important that I'm documenting what's happening to our bodies as this landscape in town is changing. And so this is Gramps, um, who's my grandmother's stepfather. So Gramps and my grandmother are not married. That's her stepfather. 
And so speaking of generations of people taking care of their families because the healthcare system fails us and because your body is discharged and discarded after these industries are finished with you. And so we took care of Gramps and I grew up as a kid watching him go from like this really like ladies man in like fedoras and suits and bow ties and alligator shoes to all of a sudden, you know, having to pick him up to wipe him and pick him up off the floor. Uh, and this was one of the few African-American men that worked in the Ecker Thompson plant that was able to retire with a pension. Um, so, you know, even though Grants voted, voted Republican and he felt a very conservative point of view, those points of views didn't stop what was actually happening in reality to black men like him. These men were working in the harsh conditions, the worst conditions in these factories, cleaning up spilt metal and slag. A lot of them died from doing things inside of the mill. For example, you know, Dennis Dickerson was telling me that he never understood why a whole bunch of black men were always missing one leg until we were sitting here talking at the academy and he realized, you know, it, it was from the, in, when, when the still uh, chills down, I guess they have a certain amount of time to move it across this track and these men are responsible for lifting it. Well, if they miss lifting this, it severs their leg. And so, you know, these were things we just accepted and there was never any compensation for this. And so, you know, going back into our home, you know, six years later after where we took care of him to see it, you know, abandoned and going back into that space, kind of embodying that loss of history, embodying that loss of labor, embodying that loss of time and also being viewed as an in invisible person in your society. And while I was dealing with that narrative, how to deal with Andrew Carnegie, a new narrative started. And so this is now the narrative that's being put on towns like Braddock in the US. Braddock is now the new frontier for urban pioneers and hipsters to go forth and reclaim the land. Like this is, this is the new narrative in the US and this is the attitude when people graduate from college, they have their arts degree, they have their social practice degree and they come into towns like Braddock or Detroit with this attitude that they can actually clean up decades of the United States government polluting and destroying our land um, it's, it's really insidious uh, to see this type of rebranding. If anything, they could have told a narrative that told the truth about how for the last 30 years people were abandoned and left there and, and working to try to turn it around instead of saying no one is there. Um, 
And it says, uh, maybe the world breaks on purpose so we can have work to do. So, you know, it's things like that that kind of push me into the position that I'm in now, which is being very vocal and aggressive um, within museums with my conversations about artists being complacent in these type of tactics being used by politicians and advertisement companies. So not only did that commercial play all over the world in theaters, um, it's all on YouTube. It's like its own mini documentary series. So at this point, people really think Braddock is what Levi's just said it is. And they also went as far as to do these billboards all over New York City. So in 2010 and 11, everywhere I walked, I saw this. I mean, it, it like Roland Barthes says, like pricking and being wounded by something, the punctum in the studio, like th that was it right there for me. And, um, you know, it's a very expensive slot to get in the first place. So think about, you know, corporate responsibility. If they really wanted to help the community and help the residents that were there, they could have took that money and really gave it to the citizens that have taken the, the hardest hit and that are the most vulnerable. Uh, instead, they've used this as a way to promote culture capital, but only for privileged, educated white students that are now coming into our community and coming to visit us through art museums and art institutions. The new museum, I'm, they've taken buses, bus trips, to come to Braddock to look at it. Like we're a spectacle. You have to hire it if you would live to be old as Methuen. You never got out the room. And here's the truth of what really I happened. I understand what room service is. You was hired in a certain department. That's where all your promotional sequence was, is was in that department. I got, I got tired of it. Uh, and what I want to say, this is the clip from Tony Buba's film, Struggles and Still, the stories about the African American workers. And again, Wyden and Kennedy and Levi's slogan says, everybody's work is equally important, go forth. And so if you look at this clip, you will hear different. I like to be a man. He was a human man. He was a man. He was a man. He told me, he said, I'll put you in that class and then bought my house tomorrow. But then I got really interested in the crane. I liked the way I used to watch them do in the stockyard. They had a coordination. Two or three cranes would unload the, the railroad cars and swing it back and, uh, and load the charger boxes. And it was, it was a team effort. And that fascinated me. I said, well, shoot, that's what I like. So I pursued that daily. I used to go to work maybe an hour early in order to see what they did down the line. As I walked down the line, I would see the man, how they use their hands. And I always, then I would go back and ask the boss, can I get a job at the maintenance department? And uh, so, um, they said, well, we ain't hiring. I said, well, you're not hiring. Well, I, you can't prove that. So the only way you could find out that is to be what you call John on the spot. You go to work every day. And if I seen a new face, I go back and tell them, man, you know, you got to admit it. They would say, nah. So that went on for, I guess, maybe a year or two, you know. But I never gave it up. So it happened one day, I went to work. And I, I told him, you got new men up on the crane. So I, I can't remember the foreman's name. Scotty, Scotty something. So he said, well, you go down and get on the general crane. But I knew in the training, they always sent someone to show you something, which just didn't happen. But I went and got on the general crane. Only thing helped me by going each and every day. I know they did this hand for this. I'm serious about this with them. And it helped me. But I guess within two or three weeks, by me on. Eating, sleeping, cream. I became as good as anybody. Seriously, I was determined. And I did it. 
So, you know, that film shows you interview after interview of what these men had to go through in order to have a job to provide for their families. And, um, you know, the elders of, of the community as well, and someone like myself who was raised by a grandparent, I'm very sensitive to elders in my community, we were very outraged about these ads. And so I realized um, that this was my responsibility. Like here, here's what you've been building up all these years, quietly making these portraits of your family. This is what it's for. Because here's this narrative that counters this whole other narrative that is racist and classist. Uh, so here you see um, this 12 piece photolithograph set called Campaign for Braddock Hospital, Save Our Community Hospital. This was made with um, activists from an activist group called Save Our Community Hospital, which is a dozen or more senior citizens, elders from the community. What I would do, the ads where you see like all the text, of course, come from Wyden and Kennedy. The other images that you see are photographs that I collaborated with them where I would show up in front of a hospital, which is our largest employer and our only healthcare provider, right? So again, the slogan that everybody's work is equally important, we are all workers. We're losing our largest employer and our only healthcare provider in an environment that is, has the worst EPA levels. So it was important for me to juxtapose those next to each other to let them clash for the viewer to be able to think about this and meditate on it for themselves. You know, this fiction versus this reality. Um, and so underneath all the appropriated images from the Wyden and Kennedy campaign is text from people who wrote to me. And so I took on the position in, as an artist, as a documentarian, as an oral historian, to inscribe their voice over top of these ads, in addition to making the portraits with them where I would show up and photograph them how they would want to be photographed with <laughs> signs that had messages that countered Levi's. And not to mention, they stole this from Jenny Holzer. So also, def not only defending my community, but defending these corporations stealing artists' work and not being respectable to our work either. I mean, it's really, I mean, we don't have horses. You know, it's not a pastoral landscape. We don't have horses. Like, you, you know, give me a break here. So, um, you know, so these are images of showing up with them, you know, different points of the day with their signs. So this is Mr. Jim Kidd, and this is um, UPMC, University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, is race-based, class-based healthcare. And then you have uh, some of the other ones calling out all the politicians, the ones that are responsible for a lot of the gentrification that is taking place. And then also pointing out that this is a global crisis because they're closing community hospitals in all types of small towns in the United States and they're moving them abroad. So UPMC now has emergency rooms in Ireland, Cyprus, Qatar, London. I don't know, I, well, I highly doubt Germany would allow that. Don't let them come here if they're trying. But, you know, this is a, it's a serious crime against humanity. And to push this further and to underscore this more, as I was saying before, once my work goes up on the wall, it's kind of, it begins after that work is up. And so I took on the additional task of being an artist in resident during the Whitney Biennial to teach programs, to teach or exchange uh, teachers from all over the US and to also teach teens in different workshops from various class backgrounds. It's very important to me to get people from various backgrounds and races and ethnicities and beliefs into a room to really deconstruct and look at these advertisements so people realize that advertisements in Hollywood teaches us how to think about race, class, gender, and citizenship and nationality. So what you see happening here is we inherited one of the billboards from like 7th Avenue, so it's like 30 feet tall. I reworked it to cut out some of their slogan and text. And then I 
put out, uh, blacked out their logo and put this uh, quote from Dr. Martin Luther King about our susceptibility to advertisement and how gullible we are. Um, and so it hung from the top of the ceiling in the Whitney Museum and it dropped all the way down to the bottom in the restaurant. I don't know if any of you have ever been to the Whitney Museum in that restaurant, but it, it covered that whole window, uh, which is important for me because the last Whitney Biennial was this past year. And so I was excited to be able to activate that space. But while um, this was hung up, to the right, there was the video playing of all the commercials and all of Tony's films. And Tony Buba was there live speaking and narrating. Sharon Zukin, who's written a lot about gentrification in New York, she was also there um, critiquing this whole commercial. And uh, I was actually dressed in a vintage 40s workers gear set up. And I had my teens there. And, and at a certain signal that I gave, which was very, all my moves are choreographed from uh, people working in the factory. So they're all based on 40s commercials and different movements that they would do when they would try to say it was, still was good. Uh, I would signal and the kids would come and they had scissors and they began cutting this billboard and I went to the top from a lift and started lowering it down and then they gave the scissors over to people who were there and people started participating in cutting up this billboard. And so here are a couple more shots. So in the middle you see the clips from all the 40s vintage uh, commercials that the United States Steel Corporation would put out. Like you see people like uh, dressed as natives trying to make work with coal and you see the, the actual steel being produced in that middle one and then the signal that the worker gives at the top when they want to roll it through the steam. And so on this side, this is a performance, a collaboration that I did with the artist Liz Magic Laser and uh, Art 21, which Art in the 21st Century comes out through PBS. But um, I worked to actually carry out that performance dressed again in Levi jeans until I scrubbed myself into the sidewalk until it shredded, which of course it turns back into blue dyed cotton. So this idea that we have about denim and branding is actually this thing that you think about the material and labor in the body symbolically through these gestures that I was making. Ultimately, of course, we lost our hospital. So we lost all our emergency rooms. We lost our only community center at that time. And um, you know, even social services for rehabilitation for drug and alcohol treatment. Like it was a major blow to the community. It's now being replaced by mixed income housing for people. And, and again, we're moving people into an area that they know is toxic. So they're moving an artist and other people who have nowhere else to move. And then the last thing that I'll point out here, in terms of who's allowed to contribute to redevelopment creatively, there are multiple things happening here, but I'm just gonna point out this right here. The Bunn family, who I've known most of my life, they might as well be relatives, uh, you know, they've been living there uh, generation after generation. Their father, grandfather fought in the war, worked in the mill, died because of injuries from the mill, kept that house in their family. They decide they want to rezone it and that they want to bring in some other type of, we don't know what the plans are, they don't show them to us. So I don't want to speculate. But Isaac, who lives there, who's been fighting to save his home, he's actually a creative person. He's a music producer. He uh, gave plans to the, to the council about being able to take that lot where, where, his, um, where the cars sit. Actually, you can see the cars sitting there. He wanted where the two cars sit to buy a lot to open up his own little business right next to his house. The city, Allegheny County, decided they had other plans. And so to stop him from being able to contribute to this, they decided to put these bundles of plastic, which have crushed rubber tires in them around his house. And there were hundreds of more houses like that. A lot of us are from this neighbor, this block. We were all redlined to this block. There was a major lawsuit against Allegheny County for discriminating against us. In fact, if you immigrated to Braddock, at some point, everyone, no matter what race or nationality you were, lived on this block. So because the, the county has its own ideas for it, they're now occupying it with these crushed rubber tires from another company. 
crushed rubber tires, if someone were to throw a match there, you couldn't put that out. You can't put out rubber. And not to mention, thousands of bundles sitting there also give off a smell and a certain amount of toxicity. So, you know, he is someone that wants to contribute to the creative class and wants to be included in the way that his community is being redeveloped. But as we can see through institutional racism and discrimination, only certain people are allowed to make these creative changes. And I think that um, museums have to be more invested in this reality that's happening instead of only giving this platform to a, a certain privileged echelon of people that only want to see poor or immigrants or single parent household, anyone that doesn't fit their description, displaced. And so I think it's fitting that I close with just this one statement from James Baldwin, The Creative Process. He wrote this in 1962. The state of birth, suffering, love, and death are extreme states extreme, universal, and inescapable. We all know this, but we would rather not know it. The artist is present to correct the delusions to which we fall prey in our attempts to avoid this knowledge. Thank you. personal and very intimate information and pictures you shared there with us, which I think is also something that a lot of people are not really used to, to, uh, to see these kind of images. And I thought that was also quite striking about your work. Um, and I wondered, um, since you're not only sharing a lot of intimate images and, and stories, um, but you also work as a political artist, I'm wondering, how how do you see your situation as an as a political artist in the art world like how how do you experience um other students like collaborative work but also institutions and the art market mm. yeah um i mean it's certainly a price you pay when you make this kind of information uh public um, I, 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 the positive thing I can say is that all of my support has come from museums and institutions in the U.S. Uh, I was very overwhelmed and surprised by the response. Um, I got my MFA in 2007. By 2009, I was in uh, the New Museum Greater New York show. And so I started, once I realized that this type of attention was going to start to come, I started uh, showing different layers of the work. So in Greater New York, I showed the portraits. That was my introduction to uh, the wider audience. Um, then I was invited to MoMA PS1. And around that period, that's when the gentrification started to really manifest itself in Braddock. So I started showing those landscapes. Um, and then I was invited to the Whitney Biennial, and that's when I realized like this was the platform to use my work to amplify the voices of the citizens from the town. Like, in, in certain cases, um, it's almost as if the institution should provide the platform and get out of the way. Uh, too often we wanna choke this thing and strangle it so we can you know, prove a point that we know certain things and we're in line with certain allegiances. I mean, I could sit here and preach to you about my love about the Frankfurt School and, and Walter, Walter Benjamin, like, I, I, I love them, and Alan Sekula and Martha Rossler, but I, I've come to this understanding, especially uh, now with institutions becoming culprits with politicians to displace working class people, um, it is is so urgent to get them in there any way you can and let them speak for themselves. Like the people must be heard in the institutions now, not the rhetoric and the theory um, any longer because someone has to start to hold them accountable. And I've found myself in this very interesting uh, dilemma, which is, you know, I'm an artist, 
and a creative class member, but I'm also the little girl from an impoverished background who watched her family die generation after generation. And there was nothing I could do except pick up the camera. And so, you know, the camera became my tool, that became my platform, that became the way that I could speak, that became the way for me to fight back against, you know, everything I hate about America, which is poverty, discrimination, uh, you know, all these types of issues that I've named during the talk. Um, because of this, I, I do realize that uh, the United States market is not supporting my work. Uh, I have yet to get gallery representation. Often I'm told it's because you're, you're young, you're a woman, you're black, you'll eventually get it, you're too political. Like, well, my artists are political, but they're not really political. Like, so, I, you know, they, they, they spin all around me with this reasons why they're not uh, interested in working with me. Um, and, and that's okay, I think that it does take time. And there, are, there may be some truths to the fact that it just takes time before you meet the right gallery. But I, I'm pointing this out because if someone like me were able to have the right gallery backing me and putting my work in the institutions they need to be in and also making sure I have an income, I could continue to pay medical bills. I could take care of my family. I could start to save up to start my own nonprofit. I could start to, you know, a nonprofit to be able to send money home to someone that's fighting their, their home and their land being seized and dispossessed from them. That means a lot to me. Um, and actually, I have a show up with this, this work on view at the Seattle Art Museum. And Isaac, we physically brought Isaac into the museum opening night. You know, you don't have to talk to me. Here, here is Isaac. Here is the man whose house is in the images. Talk to, to Isaac. And how often do you see that happen? Um, you know, working class poor people, we're not the subjects in the works in the museums. We're not who they put on the shows for. And I think that uh, that has to change, especially because of this. Um, I wonder, because, um you were you were talking about subjectivity and how how important that is for you and obviously your work is 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 informed by your own subjectivity and your background and your family and becomes part of it somehow somehow there's no real uh, border anymore between you being an artist mm -hmm. and you being a, a civilist uh, yeah. of this town right but how do you how is it possible for you to make well, first of all, a difference between the two yous, because somehow the one you is the professional you, the other you is the private you. Is there actually a possibility to separate it at all? or Only in my mind. <laughs> <laughs> I have to partition my mind for emotional stability. After a while, you just have to compartmentalize your thinking. I mean, I think we're all responsible um, as being artists and citizens. Like, we, we have to do that. And, you know, being an artist is producing the work, right? Giving the visual account to what, what it is that you're addressing. Um, and being a citizen is, you know, someone that's being supportive to what's really going on. There's a lot of things that I do that I don't need to publicly speak about um, to help uh, back at home. Uh, and so there is a distinction there. Um, but, you know, I've been so focused on trying to maintain, like, all these different things that have come and just trying to pay attention to who I am and who I am not and where my voice is supposed to be in contemporary art. And there's a massive movement to deliberately um, get rid of photography, a photography practice that deals with social reality. You know, I mean, the camera is the apparatus that can show you your world, yet institutions like the Museum of Modern Art only want to put on shows that is about making uh, cameras and uh, abstract painting. I don't want to talk about a photograph as an abstract painting. We're living in a crisis in the United States. It's not post-racial. The healthcare crisis, you know, is destroying a lot of people. And so the moment is now. Like, we need an FSA now. We need a photo league now. And that should be what uh, should be happening at these institutions that have these uh, photographic archives. But you see a malicious 
disregard and move away from it because of the art market. Um, but it, I mean, it's the battle that you have to take every day. I don't have a solution to it. I just know that I need to exist mm -hmm. and keep making the work that I'm making, knowing that it's the right thing to do in spite of what the market demands. Actually, it's in interesting to see your work today after seeing Nina Mittman's um, speech this morning because I had to think a lot about this art as education in your work, also you uh, being a professor quite soon. Yeah. And um, the question if this is maybe your fate somehow, if this is how, how it is with you, you know what I mean, like it's, it's always going to be your art but also you teaching. And the question if um, art, if you can use your art to teach, and if that's, you know, without judging if that's a good or a bad thing, but just leaving it like it is. Yeah. I mean, I think it's the artist's role and social responsibility to address um, any of these type of tactics used against people. And that's how you create real social and cultural change. I mean, my work is really about art and social justice to correct American history. Mm -hmm. And until people take on uh, being accountable to that, that mentality will always stay the same. I mean, white supremacy and patriarchy, it's a disease in your mind, and it has to be treated. And the only way to treat it is to put the image in front of you so you can see it. And, you know, that's what I'm trying to do. It's not about placing guilt or alienating someone. It's really like, it's just as harmful to me as it is to a white supremacist to do this to us. It's probably more harmful to them because in their psyche, they have to make themselves okay somehow. Uh, but they do this in very undermining ways uh, to black and Latino communities. So. I just think that it's timely and important, especially because of all the talk about social practice and all that rhetoric, that artists start to actually resist and fight back and not go along with it because they're afraid they won't get the government funding or not go along with it because they won't be included in the next group show. So, you know, there's sacrifices that we have to make. I think, no, I mean, you're definitely targeting a a clear um, problem in the art world that is happening perhaps everywhere. Um, but maybe we can open the discussion now to, uh, to you guys. Thank you so much. That was awesome and very inspiring. And made me, but I mean, you know, I was talking about Detroit, it made me realize that there's another side to that kind of story that we really need to address. Um, there are like a thousand things I want to ask you, um, but I'm going to keep it short because I know other people want to say things. When I was in Pittsburgh, um, occupied Pittsburgh, we were evicted by Bank of New York Mellon. It's the only eviction I ever saw by a bank because they owned the ground that Pittsburgh occupied. We were actually evicted by a bank. And it's, it's interesting, the Steelworkers Union kind of allowed it. And it was an interesting story. Maybe what you show and maybe think about the backstory to all that. I have two points I'll make as briefly as I can. One, you mentioned this interesting idea of connecting mining to museums and banks to museums. And, uh, I mean, there's really all, some interesting ways in which that's still happening. I mean, it obviously happened in the past. Guggenheim was an oil magnate. But it's happening now. You know, see it with the, the newest member of the Guggenheim board is a guy called Alexander Pomerov, who's mm -hmm. a Russian billionaire who made his money out of Gazprom. One of the things the museum seem to be is a way to kind of get that primitive accumulation. You get dirty, messy stuff out of the ground, and you make it clean for them, mm -hmm. leaving that stuff behind. And you see a story recently in Transfield with that whole debate in Sydney Biennale, where Transfield is a really, really nasty global mining corporation who also run concentration camps for asylum seekers in the Pacific. Mm -hmm. And I just protested in Sydney and nine people refused to be shown. And as a result, Transville were actually moved out of being so I mean, I mean you you have power and I, and I think you're using it very powerful. Um, the final thing I wanted to say is I think it's a really interesting set of nexuses between health, debt and race that emerge out of your work. Um, and you know one of the stories that's come out of Detroit is the way 
all the mainstream white supremacist media say, oh, this is a crisis with pensions. But nobody ever addresses why there's so many people on pensions. Actually, not that many. There are a lot of people. Because, as you pointed out, there's so much industrial disability from the car factories. One in ten people became disabled every year. And what they've done with that, through the bankruptcies, they managed to turn those pensions into debt. That there are things that they're sort of contractually owed now, not entitled to, owed. So as their debts, they can be reduced. And that's what's happened, of course. People have lost 5% of their pensions, they're going to lose cost of living. And when you see UPMC, which, by the way, is the University of Pennsylvania Medical Center. The University of Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh Medical Center is connected to Pitt. 62% um, of bankruptcies in the United States involve medical debt. Mm -hmm. So when, you, when the employer goes and healthcare goes, then people who are looking for emergency care end up with these enormous bills and become indebted. So one, one of the next is sort of work in your, in your work, which is kind of way in which you're making the invisibility of debt visible to me. Yeah. And I think that's really extremely useful. It, 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 it's one of the things that corporate America tries to do is, is, to, is to, to make debt, debt as invisible, to make debt invisible, to make us feel individually comfortable for being in debt. And I think what I saw in your work was the kind of way to systemically show from a very specific location how that happens so thank you for that i'm not sure if that's a question um but i mean i, I will say like it's still a day-to-day -day struggle for me like i i this is not enough you know me showing the images and even during the workshops and trying to reshape people's minds like i'm excited to go to saic because i think it's where they'll support me being able to speak out like this and teach and I can't wait to like take what I've learned today and try to set up these kind of workshops and conversations with my students there um, but you know I mean I'm, I'm on my own here in this situation because there's so many problems and this is not near New York City so people don't care unless they want to use it unless the corporations want to use it for some other agenda so the question for me is like what is that next step like do I use these photographs to to try to um, force some type of policy change like I feel like my work is stuck in some type of limbo where like I don't know what would happen to me if, if they lost their house and it was torn down. Like, I would just be so crushed. Like, I want to believe and keep fighting every day that we'll be able to preserve that house. But, you know, I can't do it alone, and I'm not sure what to do next. Like, I'm not an economist. I'm not an activist that has all this power. Um, I mean, I am an activist, but I'm not Angela Davis or Al Sharpton. Like, I don't have that kind of magnitude. Like, I wish Angela Davis would would come and help me with this situation. I, I want to get on Democracy Now! and talk to Angela Davis next month, you know? But I just, um, yeah, I'm putting it out there hoping that someone else will see this and be like, well, maybe you should present to these people instead because it really is a life and death situation. This is not art. Like, this is, these are our lives, and that's what the art world doesn't understand. They want to turn it into a project to have something to do. Like, no, people are dying across from you. Yeah, um, well, it came out of uh, my mentor, uh, Kathy Kowalski, at Edinburgh University of Pennsylvania. She, she pushed me to make the work because she saw the value in it. Um, she had spent her life photographing women in prison and photographing how her mother, Rose, died neglected. Um, so I guess her work, in a way, was also a social commentary about uh, these societal ills. And... Um, you know, one day I took my Nikon 35 millimeter home and I shot these images and I was really embarrassed about them because it's not like I sh shared this background with my peers. She saw the contact sheets. She handed me a Carrie Mae Weems book, a Larry, um, Larry Clark's book, and Eugene Richards' uh, book, Cocaine True, Cocaine Blue. I mean, when, when a teacher charges you with books like that, you know you've got some serious work to do and some options. <laughs> and so as soon as I you know, realized it was okay to go home and continue to shoot, my mom instantly 
like how the Maisel brothers uh, say, if you pay attention to someone who's invisible to society, they'll take that thing on because you're actually paying attention to them. Soon as I came in, my mother was like, follow me here, go with me here, let's make this shot, you know? So, you know, I really let her take the lead. Um, and a lot of our portraits, um, she shot, like I taught her how to shoot and she shoots them. So, you know, that's where that came from and how it built up. But again, I, I think it was an important commentary on women photographing their families, photographers photographing their families. When do we see that disruption of that buffer of the camera and actually see it be turned on its head and see it acknowledged in history? And so that's where it all comes from and why we continue to do it. We don't do it anymore because she's too sick, but. Yeah, all of us, all of our illnesses stem from this, and there's research done. I mean, the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center has logs of information about this problem. Um, so yeah, I mean, it, it's just been a buildup over generations.